And welcome back to Your Regina 120. I'm Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of Regina. Today we're going to be talking about Isaac Newton. And so, what do we think of when we think of Isaac Newton? Uh, we, when, when I was a kid and went to school and learned about him, I, I would have probably gotten the impression from what we were told about him that he was kind of like a normal scientist that you would think of today. Uh, he would have been hit, you know, hit by the head with an apple and then inspired to codify how gravity works, whether that is actually true or not. It certainly would be the type of thing that you would think that a guy like him would do. Uh, that you know, maybe he got a PhD, went through the university track, got tenure, uh, became a scientist, wore a lab coat, that sort of thing. Uh, was a kind of employed in the respectable field of science at the time. Uh, but of course, that kind of picture of him as this uh, person who uh, applied reason to the world uh, in a modern way, in, in the same way that you would kind of view scientists as doing so today, could not be uh, further from the truth. Isaac Newton was not really a scientist, but a wizard, a magician, a sorcerer, and an alchemist. Uh, when he made major breakthroughs in math, optics, physics, and other areas, uh, starting from where Descartes left off, uh, to him these were side quests. These were things that he was doing uh, because it uh, either was on the path to achieving things uh, in alchemy and in his kind of religious inspired view of the world uh, that uh, he, he would have been interested in accomplishing those ends either uh, because they were trivial uh, or because they were kind of things that you could fall out of that sort of activity. His main goals were goals like making gold from lead, understanding the words of God and when the end times were and what an apocalypse would be. These are the sorts of questions that the actual Isaac Newton, as we now know from uh, his actual writing, um, was more interested in. So things like prophecies uh, and the uh, man's position in the universe with respect to God and how, can, how we can understand it, secret messages hidden in ancient books, uh, the philosopher's stone and how to create one, uh, angels and spirits and demons, uh, and the devil himself, uh, the temple of Solomon and other kinds of things that you might see on maybe National Geographic today uh, that would not necessarily be uh, kind of pass muster in a modern view of what a scientist should be looking into, but these are exactly the sorts of things that would have captiva captivated that brilliant mind. And I've even read some of his works. Uh, he was kind of deeply uh, interested in how calendars worked throughout history, and making sure that when we have a calendar uh, that it actually works properly and doesn't, doesn't cause too much of headaches for us especially when we're calculating things far into the future, like the end of the world. Uh, so you can imagine that uh, he, was, he had this data available to him, and he was kind of trying to reconcile it all, uh, and the, the calendar is something that not, or is not necessarily built uh, for these kinds of purposes. And as mentioned, uh, we really only found this sort of thing out about him in about 1942, when John Maynard Keynes went through his writings and began to discover this kind of part of him that wasn't really publicly talked about uh, either at the time or after his death because of various reasons which we'll get into. Uh, but there's this whole aspect of this man as this sorcerer and alchemist uh, who is doing something that was not recognizably science at the time, but as we'll get into, you may notice some things about it. Uh, so what, when we go back and we start to think about what is computer science, and you know, if, if, if we're going to, to dedicate our lives to something like computer science, uh, and we're, we're using this method of uh, uh, approaching unknown and new things discovered to the human mind and to human senses, such as computers, uh, such as computing machines, uh, what exactly makes it, or what exactly makes science science, and what exactly makes science useful when dealing with these new things uh, for us to uh, kind of put our time into it. And you could kind of think of it as a uh, kind of open acknowledgement of open problems. 
uh, and that you know people kind of discuss publicly. So, for example, you can kind of think back to the, the times when the apple you know, fell or whatever, uh, and think, okay, well, maybe people were just thinking about how uh, gravity worked, and then suddenly they just came across this this system of the world to describe it. Uh, but of course, that was something that the alchemists were doing too. Uh, so the alchemists had various goals, as kind of mentioned, creating gold from lead uh, being the most important, but there were many things that they were working on at the time, uh, some of which were possible, some of which were not. Uh, but there were certainly people interested in solving these problems, so that could be all of it. Uh, we, we can kind of look to see what they were trying to do, uh, which is that, uh, or they would have thought that enlightened individuals uh, with the, or that they were enlightened individuals with the ability to gain insight into nature, the physical universe, and the spiritual realm, or at least the mysteries behind it. Uh, that is, of course, something that modern science might be interested in doing as well. Uh, they, or we, believe we have this method, this ability uh, through experience uh, to gain insight into nature, uh, to a way of approaching questions, a way of approaching things that we don't ne yet understand, uh, so that we could uh, at least theoretically understand the physical universe and even some of the mysteries behind the spiritual realm. But yet, these are alchemists who are doing this. So they have their own method of doing so. Uh, they have their own ideas for what is an appropriate way of doing so. But as you can kind of see, the goals are very much the same. And so what uh, Newton is going to be doing as an alchemist is going to be something recognizable as the same kind of thing we might be interested in doing today. But again, this stands in contrast with other competing ideologies, other things that he could have been dedicating himself to at the time. We can view science purely in terms of the fact that smart people are often employed in it. I mean, some of the smartest people I've ever met, I've, I've met in universities as professors, uh, as graduate students, as even undergraduate students. There's some real smart cookies out there, and a lot of them are doing science. Uh, and so you could kind of view what science is in terms of they're just being smart people attached to it, and it's the thing that smart people do. But this might be a mistake if we're thinking on these timescales, because the alchemists were often the same people, uh, if not smarter people. Uh, there were incredibly brilliant people, uh, Newton being perhaps the most brilliant, but there were certainly people that were up to or close to his standard, uh, at the, both in his day and before he came around. Uh, Locke, Boyle, and Leibniz, and many, many others were either dabbled or dedicated significant portions of their life to understanding the mysteries through alchemy, through experiments in the context of alchemy. Not necessarily through science, but again, through this kind of alternative way of looking at the world. And so, uh, it can't just be that they were, for example, smart, or that we are smart and they weren't. Uh, we, we could kind of think of our the way that science, and even philosophy goes uh, on to a large extent, where you, you find the most authoritative sources of information, and you kind of go from there. I mean, we kind of miss the picture a little bit these days, because we have Google to tell us everything, but uh, before Google existed, and I can remember this, uh, you would often have conflicting information, or sources of information that didn't have quite everything in it. Uh, and so you'd have to find these uh, ways to get access to data that were authoritative. So, for example, you often get translations of works, uh, and the translations wouldn't be perfect. So, there, but there was, you know, you, if you're really interested, you would, you would get the original copy in the original language. And if you had enough time and the, the skill to do so, you could learn the or original language if it was possible to, to do this. And that's exactly what the sort of thing that Newton would have been doing. Uh, he learned Hebrew and translated parts of the original, I guess, written Bible, or, or at least the oldest copy he could find, for himself, so that he could get to what he perceived to be the original meaning. I've met people who've done this themselves, and uh, again, this is the, s the sort of thing that we might associate with kind of a modern way of looking at the world and looking at history, but again, this is from the context of alchemy, from the context of someone who wants to be partake in ancient wisdom the gods are giving to him personally, not necessarily through this kind of scientific method. 
and indeed he did think that there was ancient wisdom to be found. Uh, he believed that humanity was given uh, inform or this kind of wisdom directly from God, uh, and that thing, or at least things that were not human in nature, uh, and that t the, the wisdom itself was passed down generation by gen generation, and that he personally was carrying out a part of this process of keeping this kind of flame of wisdom alive, and that only so many people could ever have access to it. It didn't help that at the time, publishing was still a new thing. Uh, the Gutenberg Press was around, uh, but there was protracted battles going on in Europe to control who had the right to print what. Uh, this is kind of during or before the Statute of Anne uh, kind of wrestled control over some of the, the ability to print works from the booksellers. Uh, and in general, there was a lot of kind of political strife happening between uh, those who controlled the ability to see what what information was distributed and what wasn't in a way that would be recognizably modern to you know, today's political battles around uh, DRM paywalls and the like. Uh, but publishing was much more difficult. Uh, and so not many people could afford to or even have access to something like Plato uh, or Aristotle. And there wasn't as much uh, kind of knowledge of what was out there. And so there was it was much easier to kind of see uh, yourself as having kind of this privileged position above the rest of the, the, the species in terms of what you know, uh, which is certainly what the alchemists thought they had. And he had a lot of books, Newton did. Uh, he had, the, at least of what we know of, the largest library of alchem al alchemy-related books uh, in existence at this time. So those books went back up to a thousand years in the past, to the end of the Roman Empire. Uh, so, and he would have read much, if not all of it, uh, and kind of annotated most of his copies with his own ideas, and tried to make sense of various uh, conflicting stories, uh, some of which were no doubt completely made up, others were uh, mistaken interpretations of experiments, and experiments that were not rigorous whatsoever, uh, with terminology that was not even necessarily different from each other, uh, but just so uh, loosely related to what I exactly was supposed to be happening at all. So instead of having cute terms like carbon and oxygen uh, to describe the things that were going on, uh, there was often uh, kind of allegorical stories or metaphors describing characters with names like Sisters of Diana, or the, the Tree of Diana, or the, the Whore of Babylon, or things like that, uh, even though what is being talked about is actually s stuff like uh, mercury, or uh, iron, or iron filings, or, or simple kinds of metal. Uh, but instead of expecting to see something like that, you would you, you often enough see uh, descriptions in terms of characters and people and gods uh, that you would be expected as an alchemist to interpret in terms of what you were supposed to do. Uh, and so there's this kind of conflict between symbols and what symbols mean and can you do things with symbols? Can you understand the world in a different way uh, by using language in different means? Uh, remember Descartes was still uh, kind of the, the idea from Descartes of, of using uh, algebra or algebraic geometry to, to understand the world was quite new. And so you would still have the, the idea that you could do uh, uh, kind of geometry and algebra uh, and treating them kind of both one and the same, again, was kind of a new idea. And so people would be afraid, for example, of things like the pentagram, of things that you, you could draw out uh, because they had this kind of extra meaning to them that people expected that could give you power or could allow you to, to, to do things with. You know, the cross has this kind of really uh, overloaded meaning that people put all sorts of weight into. You could probably understand this a little bit in the modern context by thinking about the swastika and how much people really kind of fear 
and uh, kind of believe that it means something other than just kind of squiggly lines on a piece of paper. Uh, these are the sorts of emotional attachments that people would have put into symbols, and Newton would have been part of this. He would have been part of the kind of wrapping our collective minds around what it means to write and how do you, how do you pr put truth into writing, or how do you get truth about the universe and wisdom that you have uh, through to other people, through writing, in a, a way that is uh, kind of a, uh, conducive to doing so. Uh, he would have been friends with a guy named Wilkins who was trying to design a whole language where it was only possible to say true things and where it was only possible to, to come up with ways of expressing truths uh, in, in kind of this way that helps thinking and uh, kind of guides experiment in the right way rather than the wrong way uh, and where, where you can kind of at the language level uh, start encoding truths and start getting the universe ordered into itself and into the ways that you want it to be ordered. And so, uh, questions of, you know, how, what is the best way of obtaining truth? What are the means of obtaining truth? Uh, is truth what we can see or experience? Uh, Newton would have tried to mess with his sense organs uh, and to try to kind of change the way he himself would have seen uh, and so that he's changing himself in addition to the things that he's experimenting on. Again, as an alchemist, as someone who's purely concerned with the secrets and the, the, the understanding in, in a religious way. And again, we, we can kind of get up on our high horses as scientists and think, well, you know, we're better because we go out and we experiment and we, we test the world and we we, we make sure that our, our beliefs correspond to how the world actually works. And, you know, this is also, again, something that alchemists such as Newton would have also done. Uh, he's a smart guy, and, you know, we, we don't necessarily think of it, about it that way, but, uh, again, th this is the, the idea of kind of a rigorous set of uh, uh, people uh, doing experiments and testing knowledge is exactly the sorts of things that people would have done in the dark at night while everyone else is asleep, uh, kind of in secrecy, uh, pretending that they weren't doing it. We can kind of view ourselves as scientists and as important because we have laboratories and because we've built these things, these giant buildings with tools of all kinds from the you know, small microscopes to the large Hadron Collider. Uh, of course, the alchemists too, such as Newton, had laboratories. Uh, they built them, uh, whether secret or in secret rooms or not. Uh, they certainly had the tools and put them together in places that would be, if you didn't know any better, uh, recognizable as a scientific laboratory. No different than this hackerspace in principle. Uh, and in fact, Newton's lab ended up burning down at one point. He lost a significant number of years of work uh, by that happening. But again, this is something that alchemists and scientists would have shared. This is something that uh, Newton had going for him. He had access to li laboratories, and he knew that it was important to have access to laboratories. He would have built and been interested in building them and interested in talking to people about them. We can kind of, again, view ourselves as scientists concerned with the fact that we record our observations. I mean, we, we have science literacy week happening here at the library right now where we're doing these fun experiments and we're, we're, we're using acids and eggs together. We're uh, creating cakes of different kinds of materials. Uh, but we can also look back, to, again, to Newton and the, his alchemists. Uh, and Newton recorded his, his observation. Uh, he wrote lengthy essays and journals and lab notes and much more. He had tons of raw data. Uh, and he had tons of data to infer from, and he tried to infer from it. Uh, in some cases he, he succeeded, in some cases he did not. Uh, but it would be a mistake to think that science is just writing and taking down data and went while you're doing experiments, because he did that. Uh, he wore, Newton wrote over a million words on alchemy alone, and it's worth considering you know, how much work went into carefully describing what he was doing in each experiment and the results of each experiment having actually happened. Of course, it wasn't necessarily a perfect description. Uh, a modern reader would have had no idea what terms meant what, uh, but he was writing for himself. He was not necessarily writing for other people, which we'll get into in a bit. And it was repeatable. 
the experiments that they, as alchemists, did, uh, much as you would expect in science, uh, they, they would have expected that if you start with the same ingredients and do the same things to them, that you should get the same results, that there was this kind of invariance in the play, that there was recipes that you could follow and that you should get the same results if you do it right and don't screw it up. Uh, and people encoded these recipes in pictures, in stories, and mnemonics, and associated words with each other, uh, and hopefully maybe even in the, the language themselves that they were creating, the, the kind of blueprints for what they were doing was present. Uh, we, we can kind of view ourselves as scientists as successful because of our hard work. We could say, okay, well, you know, maybe they had a, uh, some smart people and they, they had a litany of, of, of authority or authoritative sources that they could draw from and compare their work to, uh, and you know, they, they had laboratories to work in, but we work harder and uh, we, we've been able to accomplish more purely because we're hard workers. Uh, and that we should expect to accomplish more because we're hard workers. Uh, again, Newton was possibly one of the hardest working people in history uh, and stayed up late working night after night, often until 3 to 6 in the morning, for 30 odd years. Uh, he was diligent and patient. Uh, he was willing to entertain the, the, terminology, the, the terminology of his predecessors. He was willing to uh, accept and work towards their goals uh, and to kind of carefully go through uh, and put a whole bunch of time into doing so. And to some extent, it was this ability and willingness to put that much effort in that got him where he ended up getting. But again, this is something that we, we share in common with the alchemists. And if we were to expect uh, to, to accomplish things and to understand how the universe works, uh, this would not be the way to choose between, say, science and alchemy. This would just be another thing that we, we share. We could also look at ourselves as scientists because there are these in social institutions. There are uh, groups of people, you know, like at MIT, uh, where, where people get together and actually do this in a concerted way. Uh, alchemists also have these. Uh, they may not be completely recognizable as such, but there were secret orders and fraternal orders and secret societies that allowed multiple uh, alchemists to work together to divide their labor, to understand uh, what they were doing and to discuss what they were doing and to have these kind of social relationships that were defined by what they were doing. So this is something that, uh, you know, we, we can pretend that science uh, works one way, but when it is actually done and conducted with human beings, it's going to involve a lot of these social si situations uh, and you're going to be working with other people. And the alchemists were no exception. They would have uh, Newton had Boyle and Wilkins, and uh, Leibniz must have had other people in Europe. There, there were there were people you could talk to, people you could work with. This is part of what being an alchemist would have been. And at the time, uh, people would have viewed alchemy in terms of uh, God having put limits on man's ultimate ability over nature. Uh, and, in fact, alchemy was illegal. If you got caught doing it, you were hanged. Uh, we could have easily lost Newton as a teenager or a young adult before he accomplished the vast majority of what he was about to do uh, if he had been caught by the wrong person uh, of the wrong political persuasion. Uh, he could have easily been hung for his crime of trying to seek enlightenment through this particular method. Uh, and people would have been okay with that because they would have viewed what alchemists were doing uh, in light of the ethical issues of the day, many of which are still with, with us, uh, and they would sound familiar to our ears uh, because they would have viewed what he was doing as mankind playing God or playing with matters that are left best left to God. And these are the sorts of things that alchemists did. Uh, very similar, again, to uh, the, the kind of current debates surrounding Stephen Hawking trying to probe to the nature of the you know, very beginning of time. These are the kinds of questions that alchemists would have been also interested in. It is not unique to science. It is not something that we can point to ourselves and say, well, you know, th th this is what science does, um, when in fact, of course, we have this other thing to compare it to. Uh, and of course, it should also sound familiar uh, in the day and age when, for example, the FBI 
uh, is thinking about waging a protracted legal battle against group theory and mathematics uh, because th this problem of the societies we're in condemning things that learned groups such as science and alchemy can accomplish, like again, it's not new. It is something that we've had with us for a long time. And so uh, there's a good reason why the, there wasn't as much of a plain language uh, understanding of what exactly the recipes were, because there had to be a plausible deniability built right into what they were doing to protect them in case they were accused of actually participating. Uh, so that there was uh, kind of reasons for them to hide what they were doing, which kind of brings us to the point of what, why would we even, I mean, other than the fact that Newton accomplished, you know, these marvels in physics and astronomy and what have you, um, he's important because of this mistake, of the, the problem of what happens when you make uh, organized, intelligent behavior uh, illegal. Uh, and when you when you have a government and a society that condemns people for trying to push the boundaries of what can be thought about and what could be understood in the un or what could be understood in the universe, what happens is things start being pushed into the occult, uh, where groups start having more incentive to keep their knowledge hidden. Like, and what what occult means? The very word means hidden, uh, hidden things. And these are the sorts of things that Newton would have been interested in. But it's also the sorts of things that Newton would have been interested in keeping hidden. He kept one of the best uh, or most important things that humanity has ever discovered, the invention of calculus, secret for a decade, at least a decade. Uh, he, he knew and could have improved the world by uh, easily that decade, but he didn't. He kept it a secret and he only used the results from it to accomplish and make easier the things that he wanted to do. Uh, and so this is kind of the, the crux of the problem, that there's this advance being done in the mind and in the journals uh, of this brilliant man, but it only spreads to the extent that his results are able to directly uh, be usable. And like many modern nerds, he was a bit of a recluse by nature. So in addition to being having to fear for his life for being caught doing this stuff, um, he is just someone who would naturally do it. You would have to give him an incentive to help other people and to, to be social in a way outside of a very limited sense in the case, or in, as in the case of alchemists and the way that they kind of interact with each other. If you give them a, a reason to, to talk, a technical topic, uh, most nerds can kind of go on about it if they're interested in it, but they won't necessarily volunteer to start that conversation until we get them going. Uh, there's also the, the fact that he was kind of a perfectionist, and he would have seen himself as, as being this kind of holy person, receiving wisdom from the gods, so he wouldn't have been comfortable in, in publishing things that he wasn't quite sure of yet. And so there was this problem where knowledge, kind of most of the way thought through, would have been in his journals and in his ideas, but he wouldn't have given them to the right person who could have done the rest of the work for him. He would have wanted to do that himself and had the whole picture thought up in his mind. In many cases, this was a good thing for him because he was able to, to put an amount of concerted and focused effort and energy and mental thought into doing things that were very difficult. But at the same time, there's many more things that he could have done but never did. Uh, he could have discovered the, uh, the lines uh, that uh, come out when you hit uh, light um, with a crystal uh, from a certain, uh, or reflected off of a certain material, for example. Uh, he could have discovered quantum physics going through that route. He never did, again, because there was only so much time in his life. He was already learning so much about the universe. He, it was just kind of a small oversight that he missed it. Uh, he wasn't, or he wouldn't say why he was doing experiments. He would just say that he did these experiments. Uh, so if there was a reason, a, a principle guiding his action, uh, it definitely didn't get recorded and it probably didn't uh, often enough uh, get its way to people who could be uh, trying to do the same thing with him. And 
Robert Boyle was working on it during Newton's lifetime, but the Royal Society and the idea of an academic journal was still new. There was the, the ink was still wet on on the first journals that were being printed during his lifetime. And so the, the idea of sharing results and getting to the point where you can have other people replicate based purely on what they read about what you were doing, uh, that was a new thing. That this was, as, as uh, Roger Bacon would have put it, it, it hadn't been tried. And so this was something that was kind of holding him back and something that we don't have to be held back uh, in the same way. And we can tell you some of the stupid things that he did. Uh, we could kind of show you about how he would actually would drink mercury, uh, like many of his contemporary alchemists, uh, and things that he did to himself that would have changed his nervous system in a far greater way than merely seeing light through a prison wood, uh, or or way that a you know lit candle would s kind of change how you would see the darkness. But that would completely miss the point. Uh, he he tried to to do all these experiments and to to pry open the mystery that the universe presented to mankind at the time, but again, he, he kept most of his results to himself uh, and lost a lot of it when his laboratory burned and when people didn't or wouldn't even know to look for it uh, after he died. So let's kind of just draw out for a moment kind of the, the, the way that we would look at science today and kind of do a co quick uh, comparison to see what exactly is missing. Wikipedia, we have kind of this list of things that he could have done. So did he develop theories? Yeah, he did. He came up with the theory of gravity? Absolutely, he came up with theories. Did he make observations? Absolutely. He did all sorts of observations, both in the light and the dark. Did he think of questions? His notebooks are littered with questions. He absolutely thought of questions that were both testable uh, and uh, in practice uh, that he, he could have made predictions from those testable guesses and hypotheses. Uh, did he gather data to test his predictions? Absolutely he did. He would research and find things just as much as any one of us would. Uh, did he refine and reject his hypotheses? Absolutely he did. Uh, if you go through his notebooks, you can see clear instances where he would be, uh, I guess, able to and willing to uh, refine what he was saying in light of things that were known as, or, or that were just being found out at the time. Did he gen develop general theories that, that describe wide-ranging data? Absolutely. But again, the theory of gravity and this inverse square relation is exactly the sort of thing that he would have done. experiments repeatable? Well, again, we have the Newton Project now, which you can go up and Google and actually go and do his experiments. His experiments have been translated into modern language that you could actually understand and do yourself if you had the right kind of lab. 
Was there peer review? Not really. Uh, this is actually something that, again, would have been missing because he would have kept his results kind of secret. Uh, he would have shared perhaps the some processes. He would have uh, allowed other people to, uh, if forced to do so, um, kind of follow in his footsteps, but uh, there was not a lot of peer review happening. Was there data recorded? Absolutely. Again, his journals were full of it. Uh, although he wouldn't have used the word, he would have probably uh, kind of been viewed in light of someone who is presenting falsifiable data uh, and data that you can at least test in principle. And again, was data being shared? Not so much. You know, he would have uh, gone as far as he went because other people shared with him, uh, but his results were not necessarily available. And so, in short, Newton basically did everything himself, uh, or at least, you know, he, he took what was available, he used it, he made, tried to make sense of it, but a lot of the work was done by Newton and, and only Newton. And like almost every alchemist before him, he built, while he built on others' work, uh, he did so in mostly alone. And so we, we really have to kind of look at this and, and think, you know, if we're going to be approaching this topic, or any other topic for that matter, uh, we, we, we have to be careful not necessarily to, to make this same mistake. Uh, we, can, we can do better. Uh, yes, you can do quite well without doing these things. Uh, you can do quite well hidden behind a paywall. Uh, you can do quite, you know, you can make a living doing so. Uh, but the real advances uh, can be made uh, even beyond what Newton would have made. When we start taking this next step, sharing our data, allowing others to learn and improve on it, and kind of going from there, helping the, 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 the social groups that, again, we share with alchemists, uh, to kind of work in a better way to, to reinventing these groups and what they're capable of uh, in terms of sharing information and allowing that information to guide us as a group rather than individuals working alone. As usual, uh, if you have any questions about uh, magic or sorcery uh, in this context, feel free to ask them anywhere where this video is posted. Um, and uh, there should be a Bitcoin donation address at the bottom here somewhere where you can fund our whiteboard supply uh, or whiteboard marker supply and uh, hopefully you enjoy see you next video